So the question is how do you prepare for the big wide world? And you can never be fully prepared. I mean, there's always going to be um, that element of surprise that you think you know what you're doing and then somebody very gently, hopefully very gently, lets you know, no, that's not really how it's done. For me, the first, um, the first reality test came when I was asked to, I was actually still here in Bloomington, and I was asked to go back to Germany to play a recital for a 650 year anniversary of my school. And they had invited me and they, they were going to pay me a fee. And I thought that was a very generous fee. And without going into all the details, I played the concert and everything was great. And then the dean of the school in Germany asked me to come and sit with him after the concert, which I thought he's just going to say, nice job, well done. Off you go, here's your check. And he said, you know, nice job, well done. I have a check, but I don't really want to give it to you. I'd like to have a conversation with you about this check. And I thought, oh, <laughs> what did I do? And he was, a, he's to this day, he's one of the mentors that I really, really think fondly of because he said, look, you gave us a price, that's a fair price, but didn't you have to fly here to make this concert happen? And you were lucky enough to live in your family's house for this concert, but you would have had hotel expenses had you gone somewhere else. And you're probably teaching students on the side in Bloomington, and that means for about a week, flying here, flying back, jet lag, you're not teaching as many as you should. So how much of that would have that have cost? And, and I said, well, all that blah, 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 doubles the check. And he said, that's, that's right. I think you didn't ask for what it cost, and I'd like to pay you what it actually cost you to come here because we thought it was a great concert. So that's the first time I got a lesson in budgeting. And that sort of kept on going. I think one of the things that we were very good at in my time in Bloomington was to learn how to play the piano, was to learn how to work with friends and colleagues. Now what I'm seeing, especially through all these offices that have been created, including the Entrepreneurship Career and Development Program, I think people are being prepared for what it's like when you get out there and you have to negotiate on your behalf. What's it, what does it mean to make a living in music? And to be clear, when I moved to New York and, and had the privilege of leading the Orpheus Chamber Orchestra, I got a really good insight as to how the market was changing as we were working through it. Um, so this was at a time, we're talking about the uh, mid-2000, you know, around 2010, the recording industry had more or less collapsed in the United States. And an orchestra like Orpheus had a huge catalog of Deutsche Grammophon recordings, but they were producing less and less residuals. The touring market, on the other hand, was key for them. Um, they were very much focused on a residency at Carnegie Hall because that gave themselves, their musicians, and also their audiences gave them some cachet to say, you know, we're at Carnegie Hall. But truly, the area where they were most successful was to go to Europe and to go to Japan. And that's the first time I began to really grasp how international our business is. If you focus only on one market, you will likely not be successful you have to begin to realize that this market has grown quite significantly and that you have to be willing and prepared to travel to your audiences in addition to asking your audiences to come to you. And that's true if you're in a localized regional market or if you're talking about flying from New York to Tokyo. Now, with the advancements in, in online internet digital, we're seeing another major shift happening. And for a short while, people said, well, that's going to be the end of the live concert. Everybody's just going to get what they need off the internet. I don't think that's true. And the reason why I don't think that's true is during COVID, the Seattle Symphony, where I, which I lead now, during COVID, we made a decision not to shut down. We made a decision to go online. And we had a very instant uptake of many people streaming our concerts live. Uh, in the thousands. But as soon as we went back to in-person concerts, a lot of people told us rather than watching the concert online, they would prefer to come to the hall and be in our, be in our building with us because they wanted that person-to-person -person interaction. They had spent two years sitting in front of TV screens or computer screens. They wanted to be with people. So we should never underestimate that we need all the elements, but at the end of the day, we are a person to person, we are a people comes first type of endeavor. 
And that is what gives me great hope because it means that we will always be sustainable long term. It's just a question of how we do it. So the question is, what's the voice of classical music today? What's the identity of a cultural organization? And I have to say, my time in Scotland was really crucial, and now my time in Seattle as well. But my time in Scotland uh, gave me a very different insight as to how we need to keep thinking as we move forward. So I was privileged at the time that I ran the Royal Scottish National Orchestra to be invited to join um, the UK Creative Industries Federation in London. And that's uh, basically an advisory board uh, that looks at the creative industries all across the United Kingdom and what it does. And, and the first thing we did was we stopped uh, looking at it in terms of the barriers of nonprofit versus for-profit. And when you do that, you start realizing that entire industries come in that have to do with making movies, that have to do with making pop music, that have to do with creative writing, that have to do with architectural drawings, you know, design, uh, fashion industry, when all of that comes into the creative industries, and we're all related, by the way, in so many ways. Then in the United Kingdom, for instance, the creative industries was significantly larger than all of the manufacturing industries taken together. It was the UK's largest export product, period. And when I moved to Seattle, we started doing the same sort of thing. I'm also on the um, Washington State Arts Commission now, uh, which is advising the governor on arts and, and culture. And we've started looking at our industry as a creative industry rather than here are your performing arts organizations, here are your museums, here are your educational systems, and so on and so forth. And the same thing happened there too. We have some really strong players in the state of Washington, like Boeing, like Microsoft, like Google, like Amazon. And yet when you take the creative industries together, they're not maybe bigger than those, but they're on par with most of those. And in some cases, bigger even than uh, aviation manufacturing, which is still very strong in Washington state. And when you do that, the first thing you realize is breaking down barriers, I think, makes it clear to us how connected we are between all the different sectors. And then you have to do the next step. The next step is to acknowledge that all cultures are equal and that in all cultures there is a high culture. When you start going down that path, when you look at programming for underserved communities, concerts, you realize that you can't just say that my culture, the Beethoven culture, is the only high culture that exists. You have to acknowledge that everywhere on this globe, people have high cultures. And so if you want to con create these connection points that get people to come to your hall, that come to your orchestra, that may not know all that much about Tchaikovsky and Beethoven, but they have a high culture in their culture. And if you find a way to connect with it, then you can actually significantly expand your audiences. We've moved in the Seattle Symphony. We did the same in, in Scotland, actually, in the Royal Scottish, but we've moved in Seattle Symphony very forcefully into understanding that Seattle is a connection point between Asia and North America. That's where our really strong points lie in terms of our communities, in terms of the people there. And then we also added another component to this, which is the indigenous tribes, the Coast Salish people that live all the way up and down the coast of the Pacific Northwest. And we have decided that we need to really acknowledge that the indigenous people were there a long time before us, that they were creative in this space. Um, they have a songbook a repository, they, they created art, they created buildings, all kinds of things that we didn't spend enough time in our education to really learn about, but we're trying to compensate for that now. We even brought a member of the indigenous tribes onto our board to advise us in this process. And in the same, in the same vein, we're engaging with the Pacific countries, the Asia Pacific countries, uh, on a very sort of eye level to eye level, peer to peer, um, basis when we're programming now. And so coming back to this question of, do we make a differentiation between entertaining music 
and supposedly earnest music. That's what it was always in Germany, right? It was ernste Musik und Unterhaltungsmusik, entertaining music and earnest music. That's how I was raised. And the answer is we shouldn't do that anymore. There's good music and there's less good music, and that's about all that we can say. So when we have composers who have been active in the field of movies, whether it's Joe Isaishi with the Studio Ghibli movies, or, and he was in residence this year, or next year we're working with Tan Dun in residence as well, composers are composers. The medium that they're composing for is secondary of interest. What's more important is what does the music do to enhance that? Um, when we're working with artists from all over the world, we want to make sure that we give everybody a forum to be seen, to be heard, and to introduce us to things that we may not have understood. And when we do that, we generally double our audiences. So it makes good business sense to be very much aware of cultural diversity as a solution forward to the empty concert halls that we were afraid of having by now. And that fear that we maybe had 15, 20 years ago that our audience is dying out and we're all going to go in the way of the dodo bird, it hasn't happened. In fact, at the Seattle Symphony, ever since middle of December, our halls are really, really full. And I don't think it's a coincidence because our programming has been more diverse than it's ever been before.